I was hoping that we can have our panel, so maybe we'll start with Renee, uh, just introduce themselves quickly and also answer the question, um, what is lightning to you? And I mean that sort of in the long run. Lightning is a thing today, but you know, what, what is the philosophical lightning to you? Yeah, so uh, I'm Renee Pickard, um, a researcher and developer for the Lightning Network. And uh, for me personally, the Lightning Network is um, the means to really create this peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So to use Bitcoin in a decentralized way and fast way. Cool. Um, hey, everyone. I am Lisa Nygut. I work at Blockstream on Core Lightning, which is a implementation of Lightning. Um, to me, I guess, yeah, so I see Lightning as probably, you, we call it Bitcoin scaling, like the thing that's going to scale Bitcoin. I'm going to like totally get this wrong. It's cool. Um, I see it as like payment rails of the future. Um, I think it's like definitely the way to scale the number of people that are able to make Bitcoin transactions. Um, I also see it as being the most decentralized L2 that exists today, which is cool. Okay, and then um, we'll uh, hopefully get Jonathan in here in a second. Um, but Jonathan is also a fellow uh, MIT Bitcoin Club person. He was, I believe, the uh, second president of the club and hosted the expo and currently works at Lightning Labs. Um, and, well, uh, where is Jonathan EOM is a little bit of a meme around MIT, so we're looking for Jonathan. Um, so one question I have is, uh, you know, I don't have any lightning channels and I'm okay. So like, when do I actually want to use lightning? When am I going to be like, ah, I better use lightning right now? I mean, I use lightning whenever I want to pay people with Bitcoin. Um, because for me personally, the user experience is just not much better than waiting for on-chain confirmations, um, choosing my fee rate that I'm willing to pay. Um, I mean, I remember once in a while I had to wait like two months to get a Bitcoin transaction confirmed. Um, with Lightning, I usually know this much faster. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the thing about Lightning is Lightning makes a lot of sense when you're trying to make repeated number of payments, I think, between, like, a number of parties, right? And so... Um, Lightning is really like scaling in the sense that you've got a certain number of like channel parties, maybe channel parties isn't the right term there, but um, that are kind of like all embedded in this network. And the idea is that it's a bunch of people that are transacting between each other over kind of an extended period of time. So I think lightning channels to some extent like express relationships of commerce between parties that have set up basically like sort of long running um, uh, infrastructure to help manage that to some extent. Um, so I think if you're like, I think kind of what I'm hinting at here in terms of like when does lightning make sense is um, if you're just gonna pay someone one time, it doesn't make sense to open a lightning channel to do that to a large extent, um, just because of the way that like the, the infrastructure is set up. Um, well, okay sort of depends on a lot of things here. But um, but to I think a lot of times you're not gonna see a lot of like kind of return on the lightning like uh, payment stuff until you start getting into like um, more congestion on the main network so it'll be cheaper or um, you're doing a lot of transacting with Bitcoin at which point it can drive down the cost of the transacting you're doing. Okay, so I'm convinced and I'm gonna take all my Bitcoin and put them into Lightning channels because you sold me. Um, and then the year is, uh, uh, I don't know, 2042 or something like that. And then uh, everybody's doing everything in Lightning. There's, you know, blocks are full. Um, there's a, uh, a fee market. And when am I not going to be able to use Lightning and what circumstances will it make sense for me to do on-chain transactions as an individual? Okay, so, so first of all, about convincing you, maybe you don't want to put all your Bitcoin into a Lightning node. Too late. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, one, one of the 
known downsides of the Lightning Network protocol is that you cannot really operate a Lightning node in a cold storage fashion. You have to really be online all the time. Your keys are on an online or hot wallet. So there is a certain risk if your computer or your node gets compromised that um, yeah, you are screwed, basically. You have a boating accident or whatever the lingo is, right? So you, you, you may not want to use all your Bitcoins on the Lightning Network. Um, the other situation that you addressed was the question of congestion on the blockchain, if I understand you correctly. Um, and here I would argue that, yes, the block space is something that relates to the security of the Lightning Network, because eventually, if I have a conflict, I want to resolve this on the Bitcoin network. Um, but on the other hand, if there is so much congestion on the blockchain, I cannot do on-chain transactions anyway, right? So we have to find the sweet spot of what fees we can pay. Um, I think there is no developments with anchor outputs that you can basically really make sure that your transaction goes in, but you might have to pay a certain premium. Gotcha. Um, so, how many people are actually using Lightning today, or how many channels are there? Like, I don't care about people, just like how much usage is there under some metric? That's a great question. I do not know the answer to that question. Um, maybe Renee does? I don't know the exact number right now, but I think we have something like 70,000 channels that we see on Gossip. Um, those are the announced channels. There are quite some services that don't announce the channels to the Gossip Network because they are represented by nodes that do not really want to engage into routing. So, um, yeah, that's currently the number, I guess. Okay, and could we do like 140,000 announced channels? Yeah, I don't think this would be a problem. So basically, whenever you want to announce a channel, you basically have in the channel announcement message um, give a pointer to the blockchain transaction or to the Bitcoin transaction in the blockchain. So you can open as many channels theoretically as there are Bitcoin transactions uh, per day possible on the Bitcoin network. Of yeah. course, you then have to wonder about what will happen if channels closes, uh, how much congestion do they put on the blockchain. So, right? so, so what, what is that maximum you know, number if you just had to throw out a number of, if you saw this many announced channels, you'd be like, you know, this seems like enough or the maximum. Uh, I mean, if I recall the numbers correctly, we currently see something like 300,000 uh, Bitcoin transactions being processed per day. So this is the theoretical maximum number of channels. I mean, maybe on a byte level, you could make this a little bit more efficient or not, but yeah, something around this order of magnitude. Yeah, I think one thing that maybe we should talk about here is visibility into the like, transactions that are happening on the Lightning Network, right? Um, I feel like you're asking for numbers of like how many people are transacting with Lightning, right? Like what's the total number of people that are using the network? Um, I think that the answer to that is really hard to get, and part of the reason for that is how decentralized these payments are, right? So the idea with the Lightning Network is that you can remove the transactions that you're making with Bitcoin off-chain. That means that there's no public ledger of all of the transactions that you've made. Instead, every time you make a transaction, you send it through like a series of channels, like a series of tubes, um, and the record of that transaction is rather... Um, I'm going to call it like ephemeral, right? Because there's no like written record of that transaction that happens um, that's publicly visible that someone can go and count. Only the parties that were involved in the routing of that transaction would even know that it happened. Um, so it's possible that there's like thousands of people and payments that are being processed by Lightning, but because of how decentralized it is, there's no single person or view of the network that will ever be able to give you a good, I think, number of the amount of transactions that are currently happening on Lightning. Uh, yeah, I, th I think I'm more trying to get a sense of uh, like, what's the maximum that we could do and if we're gonna sort of hit a wall with that. Um, as opposed to like, you know, how many people are actually doing it. I do believe it seems to be a lot of people, but, you know, do we hit some sort of obstacle of like, well, so many, so many people fit into a train car, 
So that you know, the T, the local Boston, you know, subway, like probably you can only get a couple hundred people per, you know, ten minutes or something. Right. Okay. So when we're talking about like, so we're talking about like theoretical maximum limits of the sure. system, right? Um, okay. So I think there's a couple interesting things to look at here. Um, the one that I like to think about is in terms of like liquidity and lightning. So um, the way that lightning works is that in order to have a balance to transact, you have to commit Bitcoin to basically a contract that is on chain. And the creation of that contract basically grants you like X units of Bitcoin that you can then transact with over Lightning Network, right? Um, so theoretically, the maximum amount of like credits that it could be transacted over, Bit over the Lightning Network at any one point in time would be 21 million worth of Bitcoin. Though, okay, that's assuming all the Bitcoin has been mined like subtracting out all the amount that's been lost, et cetera, et cetera. So like theoretical maximum in terms of amount of liquidity that's available on Lightning is going to be the total amount of Bitcoin that's been locked into the Lightning network, right? So unless we're like locking all of the Bitcoin that exists into Lightning, um, at some point that's going to, I think, be like the maximum total value of exchange that can happen at, like, at any one point in time. May, may I add one thing to that? Um, so when, when, when you look at routing on the Lightning Network, it's, it's highly um, unreliable in the sense of it's a probabilistic process. And the likelihood for payment to be successful depends on the size of the payment in comparison to the channel. So if you imagine now everybody is um, using the Lightning Network in the world, I think you have something like 300,000 Satoshis of um, liquidity that every node on average can provide and obviously the uh, Bitcoin is not uniformly distributed right so but if you if you see this um, the question now is how large can the payments actually be because I mean you need to have at least two channels so you need to split these Satoshis um, yeah and then if the payment is going to be too large you're going to have problems right so I think there are actually limitations just because Bitcoin is scarce. So I guess just asking, you know, like very concretely, because I think that, um, you, you know, for my benefit and also for the audiences, like, are we talking a billion people that can do it? Are we talking like a hundred million people? Are we talking about ten million people? One million? Like, how many people actually could operationally, you know, Lightning would be something they're using? That's a really hard answer question to answer because I think it depends on what you count as Lightning users. So we just saw a great presentation by Andre Neves um, about the Lightning address stuff and a lot of the projects that he was showing that adopted it are what I would call custodial Lightning services. Um, I wish, I don't know if someone should correct me if I'm wrong, but my point is that um, all of the users of those networks are probably using Lightning to do their transactions, um, but they're probably using channels that someone else is using and managing. Yeah, well, well, do you count that? You know, that, that's sort of where I started the panel, is like, what is your definition of this? Is that in your definition I, of the Lightning Network? I see. Let's see, I'm like kind of like a big tent like person. Like I would say that at the end of the day, the settlement, the value of that transaction is being settled in Bitcoin using the Lightning Network, right? Um, the number of parties that are involved in that transaction is not merely, it's not merely peer-to-peer -peer at that point, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like having two financial institutions transacting on your behalf at that point, and the medium that they're using to transfer the value just so happens to be Bitcoin over the Lightning Network. Um, so to some extent, that relationship that you have between a Lightning service provider, I think that's what they're calling themselves, um, mm -hmm. is like, I mean, you're transacting over Lightning, but you're asking someone else to effectuate that exchange over Lightning on your behalf, right? Um, okay, so I'm gonna kick it up to Jonathan for a second, uh, who's uh, looking down on all of us now. Um, <laughs> it's blessed. Um, so Jonathan, uh, we, we started off by just kind of asking everybody uh, philosophically, like, what is lightning to you? Like, if you were to be transported 100 years into the future and you saw people doing something, like, and you're like, oh, that's lightning, you know, versus 
you know, maybe the implementation of it today being a different concept. And then answering that same question of like, how many people do you think we can get you know, onboarded into that, into that current vision? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I guess at the base there, right? it's a protocol that we want to use to move, you know, mostly Bitcoin around right now. Um, so let's say it's like on the same plane as, you know, email, which, um, kind of maybe didn't go the way we expected or the way it was intended, where there's a bunch of vari like variety of services running, uh, email servers, and there's kind of some open network. I think with Lightning, we have a better shot at that, um, just in terms of like how teams have worked on the protocol and like how easy it is to participate in currently. Uh, but I think at the base, it's just a like non-custodial and like trust minimized way to move some value around. Uh, it doesn't have to be just Bitcoin. We just happen to have like, you know, implemented it here. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but to uh, look also at the scaling side of things, I think I wanted to, uh, add on to what Renee mentioned of like, there are these bottlenecks in the network, right? So the gossip, the, um, you know, for every lightning node running, they need to keep up with the state of the network. And if we're, I don't know, uh, multiplying the number of nodes by like 10 X, probably not everybody's going to be running a server in their house, right? Not everybody does that right now. Uh, it may, like you can buy some cheap computer and like put it in your basement and pull it off now, but as the network grows, like maybe that isn't something that's feasible. But I would still say that you're using Lightning if you like have ownership of your funds, if the service you're using is non-custodial. And uh, it may be that, you know, I'm running this server in my basement and I've got all my friends that happen to be using that. Or maybe we have some like shared ownership of some node running in the cloud. But still, we have like nice guarantees about the security of our funds and, you know, what's actually happening with that node. So. Okay. Um, so Renee, can I push you to just like, give me one word answer, a number just, you know, and we're not going to hold you to it. Just, you know, I just want to know, like when I'm thinking about this, like, are we going to get to a number? Yeah. So, so you won't get that number from me, but I will give you yeah. a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so the question you're asking indirectly, as I understand it is, can we onboard 7 billion people to the lightning network? And my answer would be not 7 billion people in the world want to be onboarded directly to the Lightning Network, right? Take email as an example. We just had a presentation about Lightning Address that is like to some sense similar to the user experience of email. But many people are using webmail where they trust a certain service provider because they just don't want that, right? The beauty about Lightning Network is everybody can join it if they want to like take the hustle. And I think in that respect, if we should probably be able to onboard a million or maybe even 10 million self-sovereign users. Um, of course, as Jonathan just said, there are limitations also to gossip. There are many things that we need to work on. But I think from the Bitcoin network perspective, what I mean, that is like a really hard constraint, right? I mean, everything else is how Lightning is currently designed, but the Bitcoin blockchain really gives a bottleneck. I, I think we can go there, and my feeling is that should be sufficient to those people who really want to be self-sovereign. That's at least my perspective. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, that, that, I think that's helpful context. And I think part of what I'm uh, hearing is that it's not, and you can if I'm wrong, like if we went to 100 million channels operating you know, independently from there, it's not even necessarily that uh, there would be some sort of uh, uh, you know, big security risk or something. It's more that it would just sort of structurally not be possible to assemble a network like that, given the constraint of like how many Satoshis are available. Yeah, I mean, like if we kind of take what Jonathan was saying, that he thinks that Lightning doesn't necessarily a Bitcoin-centric um, project. So I think it's like there's two questions here, right? Is this a is Lightning a Bitcoin scaling like solution, and is that like its sole purpose, or is Lightning a technology of how to transfer value um, in a very decentralized manner uh, that can kind of have other types of value locked into it that it's then transacting? If it's just Bitcoin, then how many satoshis, how many transactions to open channels can you fit into a block? 
Um, so like, you know, and that's important because it's like, okay, there's like X billion people that want to open a lightning channel because that's the only way they can get onboarded onto the network. How many blocks would it take to get X billion channel opens done given the current constraints of the Bitcoin layer one, right? I feel like this is a question that comes up a lot with lightning. Um, again, that assumes that those X billion people aren't using like centralized service providers that are managing those channels for them, but rather that they're all self-sovereign and basically running their own lightning infrastructure, et cetera, right? So those are all like questions that um, are useful and important for asking when you're looking at lightning as a way to scale the number of Bitcoin transactions per second that can happen, right? I think that if you kind of take lightning and look at it as the view is what Jonathan, I think, suggested, um, and that Lightning is a technology for contracting and for building payment networks that are decentralized um, and hopefully more anonymized, um, then the if it's decoupled from the L1 in terms of the value you're transacting, and I'm not saying that there's like plans to make that happen or anything anytime soon, um, but then I think these questions suddenly become a lot murkier and it's kind of a bigger like, okay, is Lightning the technology and standard set of how you transact value over more generalized um, forms of like cryptocurrency contracts, or is it just the Bitcoin one? Um, so. Cool. Yeah. So, I guess as we're kind of looking at where things are evolving to support more of that vision, who here has heard of Taproot? Raise your hand. All right. So we got a lot of people who've heard of Taproot. If you haven't, Taproot is a recently activated new feature for Bitcoin. And uh, a lot of what I've seen online suggests that like Taproot fixes a lot of these things, and Taproot's really good. So what's going on with like Taproot and the Lightning Network, and how might this thing that has been activated but doesn't necessarily mean it's deployed yet, how might that change the shape of what's possible? Uh, I could give some answers here. So I think one thing that Taproot can fix, assuming it's widely deployed, is um, the privacy of channel opens. Uh, so we have this on-chain footprint when we open a channel and when we close a channel, and we have these scripts in there, right, to give some guarantees about refunds and um, making sure that we're, like, locking up the funds for the channel correctly and then exiting correctly. And right now, that is very obvious, right? If you look on chain, you can find, you know, channel opens and closes, uh, but we can move those scripts into, like, I guess, hide them uh, by using a Taproot transaction. And then we get on-chain transactions that look a lot like, you know, other uh, on-chain transactions, assuming other wallets adopt Taproot, which they probably would. Uh, so that's something nice. Uh, another benefit for Taproot is that we have this whole like other way to embed information now in transactions and in like channel updates. Uh, so with this protocol, Taro to embed like asset information in the Taproot tree. And the nice thing about that is that this doesn't impose uh, like a cost to people who aren't using it or to people who aren't participating. And I'd be looking forward to see actually what other protocols come out that are embedding data in that tree or like make good use of that. I think. Right now, we're still at the point where, you know, like base libraries and implementations are adding support for Taproot and that, you know, will be done soon. Uh, but then you also have to figure out how to upgrade the network, right? So, you know, right now we have a bunch of channels out there and ideally we don't, you know, close every single channel and then reopen it with a Taproot funding transaction, right? Uh, that would be a lot of strain on the network. So uh, there are some proposals as well to figure out a better way to upgrade like the channel types so that we can, you know, better support Taproot use in channels overall. I was going to say, I think to kind of build on one of the cool things about, so Taproot in terms of privacy, I think um, the on-chain footprint part, it's actually only, I would say, like maybe 30% of helping hide where your channels are on the network. There's a whole another thing that we'll have to fix that Taproot doesn't solve before we can improve that measurably at all, really. Um, however, moving over to Taproot in terms of privacy is good for decorrelating payment paths through the network. So right now, 
if for some reason you had multiple nodes on the network and a payment got sent through multiple hops on the network, um, the data that you use to basically lock those funds into escrow as it moves across the network um, can be correlated. By moving over to Taproot, I believe we're able to move over to something called PTLCs instead of HTLCs, which is a point time locked instead of hash what, time What is locked. an HTLC? Can you, can you start there? I don't know what it is. Yeah, hang on, let me finish this thought really fast, and then we can loop back around to what an HTLC is. Um, but the general idea then is with Taproot, you'd be able to use tweaks to um, use unique identifiers per hop, such that if for some reason someone's running multiple nodes or your payment loop through the same node multiple times before reaching its destination, every payment that went through would be um, you wouldn't be able to correlate it to any other particular power uh, uh, hop that it made, so to speak. Um, yeah, okay, so what is the HTLC? Renee, do you wanna take this one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, HTLC is basically um, a contract that allows to make a conditional payment um, in condition with time constraints. So what I do is if I want to forward a payment to you, I offer you an HTLC, which is a contract, and if you can provide a certain secret, then you can reclaim the payment. And after a certain time has passed, I can basically cancel it and I can spend the output if you hadn't provided the secret in this time. Um, and the reason why this is useful is we use this to ensure that a payment is being routed atomically across the network because everybody is committing to the same payment hash. And this is exactly what Lisa was talking about, that currently we can correlate these things. And remember I said before that the payment process is a probabilistic process, right? So. When, when I want to send a payment via Lisa to you, Jeremy, it might very well be that there's not enough liquidity in the channel between Lisa and you, so then I have to find another route uh, to you, right? And a lot of people might be aware about the payment at some point in time, um, yep. So like, if we're just like on stage and I wanna hand a quarter, which you know, we're using analog, you know, fiat money, um, analog energy, um, so if we want to use our analog energy and I hand uh, a little lump of metal, what you're kind of saying is I don't let it go, but I, you know, Lisa's holding on to it, and then uh, she hands you a piece, and then she lets go at the same time that I let go. Is that sort of what you're explaining? Yeah, exactly. So, so, so that's the idea, right? I mean, if we, if we go back to the example of the quarter, I mean, usually in the physical world, what would happen is you would give the quarter to Lisa and ask her to forward it, right? Because and then, of course, she could run with it. Yeah, I don't trust Lisa. Yeah, so <laughs> that's, why, that's why you keep your hand on it, and she has to have a second quarter that she gives to me, and she has to prove to you that she let go, um, and this is exactly how the secret of the hash is being released in the hash time lock contract. Gotcha. And, and so when we go from HTLCs to PTLCs, like what's concretely changing under the hood? Yeah. So I just wanted to like kind of maybe reiterate what you guys just said. There's kind of this two phases of sending payments, right? There's a commitment phase and then there's a settlement phase. Um, commitment phase requires there to be like a hash, which is like an identifier of that payment, which also acts as a secret that gets committed to at every channel. So if there's a channel between me and Jeremy, we would commit to that hash. We'd allocate funds, put them in escrow, and it's basically locked with that hash, so to speak, in a contract, um, such that the only way that we could get the money out um, is via a secret that um, like matches that hash or through a timeout, basically, the money would exit escrow. So there's two paths for money in a channel to escrow, escrow exit escrow after it's been placed into it. It's, um, and that's what the HTLC kind of stands for. It's the two ways that you can exit escrow. It's either with a time lock, so which times out, or a hash, right? Um, so the same hash gets committed to in the, ch the contracts of the channel on every single like um, channel that that payment touches, right? And then as Renee was explaining, if at some point as a payment is being locked into channels, are basically committed to escrow in each of the channels as it makes its way in the commitment phase, so to speak, of a payment. Um, if it fails at some point, then those basically have to be rolled back, those commitments have to be rolled back along the chain, 
and then you retry and you have to use the same hash. Um, that's just the way the payments work right now. You have to use the same hash when you retry it because that's how the person you're paying is going to be able to effectuate the settlement after the contracts have been. So you commit, the payment makes it all the way to the node that's able to furnish the, we call it like pre-image, but basically like the unlock that will pull those funds out of escrow um, and each of the, the channels that it's been committed to. Um, so basically you have to provide, you, you can't like use a different thing on payment attempts re-attempts, right? So to some extent, depending on like what visibility and how many parties you're exposing that to, to some extent it exposes your like intent of that identifier to make a payment, right? So uh, PTLC is, is the ability that at every hop that you make, and I don't know enough about the proposal. Um, I think Andrew Polstra was the first one to propose it. <laughs> Um, uh, to bring you down here. Uh, this, um, it's like scriptless script tweaks or something. I'm gonna get that wrong, name wrong. But um, the cool thing about it is it allows you to have a separate identifier for every um, contract that you're committed to, you commit the funds to in escrow. So every escrow key to unlock those funds is unique across every channel contract, so to speak, um, that the funds get escrowed in. So. I'm a pretty like disorganized guy, and it sounds like what you're telling me is that, like before I had to keep track of a lot of stuff, and now I've got to keep track of like even more stuff. How much stuff are we talking about keeping track of, and, you know, and what what sort of stuff do I have to keep around and not lose, like my phone and you know keys and stuff? So 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 there is this kind of like famous node coming on the Lightning Network currently that is called zero fee routing. <laughs> because uh, this person basically made the claim that um, for, for, for various reasons it might be useful to just have zero fees at all in routing. Uh, and well, you got zero base fee on your shirt. Is that your node? No, 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 no. The zero base fee is a different thing, right? There is okay. the fee rate and there is the base fee. But what, what this person did is basically um, the person said, well, I charge for people to open channels with them, right? So I provide them liquidity, so there they're actually paying me. But while I'm routing the payments, I'm not charging anything anymore. And of course, what this person does is it undercuts the market because currently most implementations make their routing decisions based on fees. Um, and the reason why I'm telling the story is this guy recently made a tweet of saying my channel database is growing at like five to something gigabyte per day. Um, yeah, so that's a lot of stuff. So, and that's a five gigabytes that he has to uh, keep around forever. Or when can he like delete it? When the channel closes, of course, he can delete some of the stuff because then he doesn't have to remember anything anymore. But as we just discussed before, if we want to onboard a lot of people on the Lightning Network, we do not want to open and close channels all the time. So yeah. I think is this is this the thing that we call like toxic waste? Am I is that the right? I think that's the topic of like the Lightning. Toxic uh, yeah, waste maybe. Stuff. I'm just trying to figure out like if I go to Best Buy, I could buy like a terabyte or two for you know a hundred bucks. So like, am I going to earn you know a hundred bucks for? Is this guy making a hundred bucks a day? Because then maybe it, he can just go to Best Buy. I might have a coupon. So, so, so I don't know his financials, but I know that he takes something like initially two thousand ppm to open a channel. So that's like. 0.2% of the liquidity in the channel, and he guarantees the channel to be open for one or two months, I think. Um, I think he recently increased the prices and changed something, I don't know, but um, yeah. I think we're conflating a bunch of different topics here all at once, so maybe we should like... Yeah, you want to break it down a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> what's, going, what's going on? Where are we off the rails? <laughs> yeah, because uh, I, I feel like, so we were talking about how expensive is it to open a channel, and how much do you like... How, like what helps cover that cost of opening a channel, right? Which um, you guys brought up a node that's pretty famous on the Lightning Network called Zero Fee Routing, which famously doesn't charge any money to route payments through it, right? So the big question with his node tends to be, okay, if he's not charging money to route payments, opening and closing channels has a, a physical, like real world Bitcoin cost in the layer one, you have to pay an on-chain fee to open and close a channel. So if this node is not routing, is like not making any money um, by moving money, like moving Bitcoin across the channels that he's opened, 
is he just net losing Bitcoin every time he opens and closes a channel? I think is one part of it. That's distinct from like the toxic waste part that we were talking about a little bit earlier, um, which is that has to do with the amount of state that your lightning node individually needs to keep track of and on disk and for how long um, for all of these payments that happen and like why that is, et cetera. Right? Gotcha. Yeah. So I guess like if I could restate it, there's no amount of money that would make me not lose my keys every time I'm at home and I like put my keys somewhere. So it's not really, there's a question of like how much money would you pay to solve this problem? And there's a question of like can people actually solve this problem? Wait, okay, so what do you, can you restate the question about the keys thing? I don't quite follow. I just mean like, you know, like you go home and then you like, you know, lose track of your stuff or like you, you know, you, you get a, you know, in this context, a database corruption. And so there's really the question of like things that, you know, economically might be in your interest to pay for and things that are just like, even if they're in your economic interest might be operationally hard for you to do, like, you know, not losing your belongings. Yeah, I feel like this is yet a third kind of topic with lightning oh, no. <laughs> stuff. Yeah, um, which gets into like the um, what do you call it? Like recovery of funds, or like I have funds that are committed to lightning channels. You know, with Bitcoin, I know if I lose my keys, I'm in a lot of trouble on lightning. Like, what is the equivalent of like losing your keys for lightning? Right? Like, that's kind of like I feel like what you're asking. Yeah, I think a bit. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the follow-up is, like, is there anything we can do about that? But start with, start with whatever. Because you know. <laughs> earlier I was convinced that I wanted to put all my Bitcoin into channels. Now I'm not so sure. So, like, how might we, like, rectify oh, that? You right, know? I see. Wait, and so you're not sure you want to put all your money in your channels because of the cost of deploying it? To well, now I heard I've got to go and buy a 5 gigabyte thumb drive every day. I see. And, uh, you know, also that if I lose that, then I'm going to lose all my money. So, like, now I'm, like, I'm a little bit more skeptical. So, like, how might we get around those problems? Yeah. So, I think some of, the, some of what kind of Jeremy's talking about is this kind of the construction of the way that Lightning works is you have your money locked into channels, right? So, one general, like, you know, one general class of, okay, what do I need to remember? What kind of state am I storing is, like, the first most basic step is, okay, who do I have channels with? Like, if you were to, like, take your, let's pretend, that, like, your secret, your keys, um, you know, the private key material that you use to update the contracts that make lightning channels, right? Like, the um, Bitcoin transactions. So you have a key that signs those. Okay, let's say you've got that. You've, you know how to store keys. You've, like, successfully stored this key. Your lightning node goes down. All of the data on your lightning node is wiped, right? Okay. First thing you probably need to figure out and would be good information is to know which peers you had contracts with, right? Um, the way that Lightning contracts work today is that there are two of two signed contracts, which means you basically enter into a Bitcoin transaction agreement with another peer that there is an output on the Bitcoin blockchain that both of you must um, create signatures in order to spend that output. So any transaction that spends this output on the Bitcoin network, that is like that is lightning channel. That like output in the transaction set that must be signed by two parties, um, and those are your channel peers, right? Okay, so you still have your key, but you don't know who you have any any channels with. You're in a lot of trouble. Um, because you don't know who to like go back and like ask like, hey, I need you to like sign something for me, right? So even if you could magically like recreate all of the transactions that you had like signed, or that maybe you know for some reason you know what all of your outputs are, um, so you've backed up what keys are and you've backed up what all the out points are. Unless you can figure out what the other party of that two of two was to sign those outputs, so you can get your funds back, you're kind of out of luck, right? So that's kind of, I think, like the first layer of information that you need to remember about like a lightning thing, right? So your funds are out there, but there's another party, and you need to remember who that is because if you lose all your stuff, then that that one sounds kind of fundamental. Like there's nothing we can do to make that better. I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, if you just not lose your your stuff in the first place, um, that would be <laughs> pretty good. But well, yeah. So there are um, all alternate channel constructions, right? So right now we have like the original uh, kind of paper from Taj and Joseph that the amount of state and like toxic waste we need to keep, right, is uh, linear in how many updates we do, right? So the reason that guy, um, that zero fee node probably has so much state to keep track of is like for every 
payment that is routed through them for every channel update, they need to store that kind of indefinitely until they close the channel. Um, and there are alternate constructions like L2 where the amount of data that you'd need to store is kind of static, right? So you just store basically the latest state uh, and I think some extra information and you would be able to get kind of the same security guarantees there. Uh, I think that's an upgrade that, you know, isn't deployable right now, it's still kind of far down the road, but that would help a lot um, in terms of what you need to store and not reducing what could be forgotten, but at least kind of the risk and like the resource requirements. Uh, and that, that also, you know, would be helpful for if we're thinking about light clients, you know, and like, uh, what can I do with some device that's like my phone or something that's intermittently online or that doesn't have a lot of storage, you know, can I participate? Uh, I think that's also helpful in that respect. Yeah, so I think what Jonathan is talking about then is like after you know who your channels are, there's a whole nother set of information you need to save, which becomes this toxic waste thing, right? Um, I don't know. Do you, I mean, I don't know, Jonathan. So, so it sounds like a little bit of what you're saying is like if I am going to a bar and I'm going out like drinking with a friend, I would just need to remember who bought the last round. I don't need to remember the history of all of our drinking sessions because I'm already drinking. I'm not going to remember. <laughs> I might, I might like write down in my wallet, like on one business card, you know, who got the last round, but I'm not going to keep a record of every time we went drinking. Yeah, so let's talk about yes. why that is, though. Yeah. Um, so like, uh, like Jonathan mentioned, the current construction uses, I think they're called Poondraja channels, is the technical name of the current um, implement uh, protocol that channels use. And the way that it works is that every time you update the current state of the money in a lightning contract between the two parties, you have to remember every, pre you don't have to remember every, you kind of have to remember almost every previous state and also um, in order to invalidate, so you have state updates on this contract, right? And the state that you're updating is the amount of balance of who owns what between the two parties in that channel. Every time you update, update that state, the way that you prevent your channel party from publishing an older state such that they can't roll back time basically to a state where maybe they had all the money in the channel and then they paid it to you over like 10 updates so you're not the 10th update, but then they go back and publish the first update such that you know, now they have all the money again and that's what's officially on record on chain and so they like spent money but didn't actually like spend the money because they were able to get it back on layer one. Um, the way that the Pundraja channel construction helps prevent this problem is by issuing something that we call like a revocation key or revocation, yeah, I think it's a revocation key is the technical name for it, that kind of makes each of those past transaction states sort of like toxic waste for the other party, such that if they ever publish an older state, um, that is what gets committed to chain and that, um, the other party then has this key that allows them to take all of the money that was originally locked into the two-party contract, so to speak. So the waste is toxic in the sense that like, you can't get rid of it. If you accidentally forget what the most recent state was and publish an older state to chain, it exposes you to complete and total loss because your channel peer is able to take all of that money out of the channel for themselves. It makes it such, yeah, so then if you do have this um, database backup, uh, like total loss that we're talking about, um, if, even if you are able to figure out who your peers are, in order to continue using that contract and not have to do like an emergency shutdown or whatever, you basically can't because you don't know what the current state is, so you don't have like any information that you can then like keep advancing it. Also, you're at a lot of risk at that point at your channel partner publishing a past state that you don't have the ability to like revoke the keys from, et cetera. Okay, so I think unfortunately we're basically uh, almost out of time here, so if somebody can tell me if that's the case, yeah. So <laughs> we're gonna wrap up, I, I guess just sort of trying to summarize and synthesize from everything that I'm you know, hearing is that Lightning as it is today, we're gonna be able to get to you know, maybe, you know, a million, maybe, you know, 10 million people or something like that who are able to self-sovereignly host themselves, maybe a lot more, who are gonna be able to use services that are maybe of you know, good reputation, and those services themselves will be completely self-hosted, and maybe that's a way of bringing in a lot more people. 
Unfortunately, it's difficult with what we have today to actually run one of these services at large scale and might require a lot of storage. You're at a very competitive marketplace where your competitors are willing to do the work you're trying to do for money for free. And so that might you know, be very, very tight and competitive if you're trying to make money out of it. If you're just trying to you know, send your own payments, maybe that's a better experience. But there's a lot of exciting research that is going to maybe make the operation of that much better for the 10 million people that we could support. And then in the future, maybe we're going to focus on growing beyond that. Would you say that that's like a, a summary of where Lightning is at today? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's work in progress. I think that's the important thing to note here, right? It's, um, there's still room for improvement, how I usually say. All right, cool. Well, uh, give a big thanks to our panelists.